Hey everyone, thanks so much for checking out the sixth episode of the WeVA podcast. Today I'm joined with Alex Kanan, a machine learning engineer at Zencaster, where they're bringing all sorts of cool applications of deep learning, uh, search applications to podcasting, such as what we're recording this podcast on right now. So Alex, thank you so much for uh, being a guest on the podcast. And could you please tell us about Zencaster and the kind of things that you're using the WeVA search engine for? Hey, Connor. Um... Yeah, thanks for having me on the, on the We Be It podcast. Uh, my name's Alex. I'm a machine learning engineer at Zencaster. Um, and Zencaster is basically, for those who don't know, just a podcast recording platform, um, among other things. Um, but yeah, basically, we've, we've uh, been working on transcriptions um, over the past few months, or we released transcriptions a few, a few months ago, really. Um, and we have sort of started to employ Weviate as a way to smartly search through podcast transcriptions. Um, but yeah, I mean, before Weviate, um, this is something we'd been attempting to do for quite a while. Um, so we went through a lot of like really early itera iterations of our own idea of like a vector search database. Um, I remember I started out with just like TFIDF keywords and word to vec on those keywords so um you know seeing like a fully managed like vector database system like weV8 uh really just knocked my socks off and it's been wonderful to use so far yeah that's super cool that the um trying to build your own vector search database i, I used to do things like that too where when i was experimenting with say uh gans and cfar 10 i'd uh, generate the image, encode it into the latent space with an image classifier, and then search through a vector representation of my own data set just with the dot product with everything I had in the database. And that kind of transition of trying to um, like build up your own vector search database compared to these platforms like WeV8 and then plugging into, say, Haystack or Haystack Pipelines or the Gina flow of connecting it to these whole search engines. It's really interesting how little of that kind of stuff you have to build yourself. So how easy has it been for you uh, plugging in the Weaviate components like the vectorizer, the modules, and all that into the uh, podcast transcriptions? Um, it's been great. Uh, we actually ended up uh, settling on a sentence transformer um, before we even knew about Weaviate that Weaviate supported. So it was a very simple um, setup in terms of just you know, the WeV install page has like a Docker Compose where I could just select the exact transformer we've been using. Um, but yeah, um, it's wonderful to have really, I mean, a lot of like machine learning tools um, tend to have like pretty loose ideas of deployment. Meanwhile, WeV8 has been pretty rock solid for us, um, which is something we really appreciate. But yeah, it's been very easy to set up. And I like it. Yeah, I think the case of uh, podcast transcriptions is a really interesting topic around this idea of whether you can just use an off the shelf model or whether you need to fine tune it on your data set. And because I think with the, with podcast transcriptions, you're not going to be able to have a massive data set unless maybe you use something like uh, federated learning where you don't store everyone's conversation in your uh, Zencaster database because, you know, maybe people don't want to have their podcast in a central database that's used to fine tune the sentence transformer. So have you found a pretty good result of just using the how the WeV8 has the Docker Compose that you just point to, say, a hugging face model weights, and that's all you need to get up and running with this? Pretty much. Um, I mean, uh, my reasoning, um, personally, is basically podcasts are essentially just conversations. So if we just if there, I mean, there are like plenty of conversation data sets out there. Um, like Fisher for one is like a pretty great conversation data set on the small side, I guess, but um, they're out there. And if we just use a sentence tra transformer that's trained on like casual conversation, I'm pretty, we're pretty confident that it'll have, you know, great performance on podcasts as well. And, you know, there's, there's always, you know, more, performance you could probably eke out of, you know, fine tuning it on uh, perfectly in domain data. So that's definitely something we're thinking about. So I actually haven't heard of this Fisher data set. And I'm sorry about that. I, I've seen uh, like dialogue GPT, 
Uh, I've studied things like the Mina chatbot, the Facebook's internet augmented dialogue generation. I'm not really uh, too caught up with the chatbot data sets. Do you mind telling me a little more about the Fisher data set and what kind of uh, benchmarks are being used for chatbots? Sure. Uh, well, yeah, Fisher is um, not really a chatbot data set per se. It's it's a very old data set. It's like from the, the Linguistic Data Consortium, um, like 95 or something. But um, yeah, it was just like some like exposition that people went to about speech. And I think some people like set up a little booth where two people would go in and record like a few minutes of dialogue together over at, about like random topics. Yeah, I've read some really funny papers about how they uh, set up these data collection pipelines for uh, the chatbot data sets where they have, uh, they, they call it like wizards of, uh, wizards of turns. It's something with wizards in the thing. And it's about how you have these randomly assigned contexts and the way that they try to crowdsource worker annotations to build up these data sets, I think is, is really interesting. What do you think about just say doing a web scrape of Reddit conversations as a, as a data set? compared to these ideas of uh, having like a scripted character that you read into and then you record podcasts on this platform to create these kinds of data sets. Yeah, that's actually a very interesting um, sort of distinction between what people, how people talk online and how people talk in person. Um, we, we've actually like built some like basic like Reddit scrapers previously, um, or I have rather, but um, I guess Online dis online discourse is uh, much different than in person discourse. I mean, just in terms of text, it's completely different. People do like emoticons. Um, they like try to write out things that can't really be read aloud. I don't know if that made any sense, but yeah, they use abbreviations. Yeah, I've been so interested in that topic as well. And I love this like um, idea of having, say, style transfer as like a sequence to sequence machine translation problem and where you say transfer from a casual style to a formal style to and like they can learn it unsupervised. And the first paper that I, I read this paper uh, where they translate from Python to JavaScript with neural machine translation completely unsupervised. And I, I couldn't really I like really couldn't believe that works. So if they can translate from Python to JavaScript, I'm certain they can transcript from casual styles of speaking to more formal styles of speaking kind of, do you think that like that idea of style transfer from the Reddit conversation style could transfer in an unsupervised way into the, um, into say a real conversation like we're having now. And then, and then do you think that style transfer algorithm could then be used as say data augmentation to kind of, uh, smoothing out that like interpolation line where you take your data and you have like levels of how formal it is. Does that sound like something that might be able to bootstrap the Reddit data into podcast transcriptions? Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. Um, I imagine, I mean, so for the Python to JavaScript style transfer, I imagine they must have had some data set of like code that is equivalent in both Python and JavaScript. Um, I'm just assuming. I don't, did they? Did, did you? Yeah, they have this. The, so the, they do this round trip consistency thing. It's it's similar to CycleGAN, how you go from zebra to horses and then back to zebra. So you structure the loss with how well it can go back to the zebra from the intermediate horse. And then, and then I think you also have, uh, you probably also have some kind of grounding loss, like in the picks to picks paper where they go from the, sh the photograph of the shoe to the sketch of the shoe. They also do like a, like a L1 mean squared error or, or over just all the pixels to structure it as well. But generally that kind of round trip consistency idea of I translate to French and then I take the artifact of the French translation and go back to English with some other model. So for some reason that seems to work without having some kind of shortcut in the representation. Wait, so it it guesses the transformation to the other one and then tries to transform it back. So, so is there like, I assume there's like loss from like each step it gets accounted for? 
Yeah, yeah. Generally, in like the Psychogan framework, you would criticize how well it's made the. So it's going from horse to zebra back to horse. You do the in the Gan kind of framework. You do the real fake on the zebra, and then you also do the real fake on the final horse that comes back out of the intermediate zebra translation. And that's that kind of way of thinking about it seems to work really well for not only Python to JavaScript or casual style of talking to formal style of talking, but also for uh, question context answer triples where you generate some kind of potential question and then you use, and then you mask out the, uh, the answer or the context, and then you use your generated question to uh, generate a new answer. And then you see if that matched the original tuple and they, they can use that to, uh, to generate, that's how they say, um, use generative models to produce, uh, synthetic data for question answering data sets. Okay. Interesting. And, and this all involves having like a data set of like the, zebra and the horse right yeah what's so interesting about it to me is how casually you can label these domains like you don't need to annotate the data so severely you just kind of say this is python this is javascript or like this kind of domain annotation for self-supervised or like uns it's like self-supervised i wouldn't say unsupervised machine translation because to me that just means like looking for structures it doesn't mean like optimization but like that kind of free annotation or like easy at scale annotation you get from self-supervised learning where all you have to do is just label the domains. Like this comes from books, this comes from scientific papers, this is Wikipedia, right? And the way that you can just do that to annotate these domains and you end up annotating like a massive amount of data pretty easily compared to say the manual, this is the answer within this context for question answering labeling or that kind of thing. Okay, cool. Yeah, that's, that's very interesting. I mean, yeah, as long as you just have to label the the domain of the the data and not it doesn't have to be like a one-to-one -one representation then yeah i imagine this could also work for style transfer on text as well um yeah i mean the only thing different i'd say is that like text is sort of a linear thing um or like a sequential thing rather um instead of like an image i guess in the, in the case of the zebra horse but um yeah that's a very interesting idea as, as I mean, I'm usually a proponent of being very hesitant to include an, another model in the pipeline of training a model. Um, so yeah, I mean, this would be essentially that. Um, so if we want to retrain the, uh, like transcription model or like the embedding model, we would need some in domain data of like podcast transcriptions um and style transferring reddit data is sort of a, a lossy step in that sense um that being said it's pretty easy to get a hell of a lot of both out of domain data and in domain data um you know from reddit or some other form and then from you know some in domain data, which I, I wanted to say books right there, but really, I guess that doesn't like scratch like the in domain um, vibe of like disc like podcast discussions. So yeah, I mean, if there, I mean, if there, if there is a, if we, there is a good data source for in domain like podcast discussions, then. And if, if it's enough to actually like train the style transfer, then I imagine that also would just be useful to train with by itself um, or to fine tune like an embedding model that would fit into BB-8. Yeah, I love thinking about that concept of transfer domains and maybe like domain and affinity, how well transferring from one kind of say Reddit or books or IMDb movie reviews is going to transfer into some kind of other language domain. I think that's one of the most interesting topics. And I also think you hit a really interesting point, that idea of if you use a generative model in your data augmentation pipeline, you might have compounding errors where the bias of the generative model just <laughs> runs away and makes the discriminative model even more biased. And I guess maybe I've been like interested in things like in images, how we have say variational autoencoders where you have that loss on uh, diversity and trying to cover a lot of the data space and tr and hopefully avoid like a mode collapse in GANs and then using that to augment your data would be horrible because it's just, 
you're just collapsing your discriminative model on that kind of uh, mode that your GAN has overfit to, or or like, um, I don't know if you call that overfitting that mode collapse GAN thing, but that idea that the generative model just doesn't cover a diverse enough space of the data distribution that using it as an augmentation model would just not be good at all. So one other question I had is, um, what about using, say, YouTube, where you could probably get thousands of podcasts on YouTube and and uh, and just kind of download it that way? Well, yeah. So, I mean, there is YouTube DL, which is a wonderful tool that I think is like not totally kosher anymore. Uh, I think YouTube doesn't like it. I think like tried to take it down last year, I believe. But um, yeah, I mean, that's something um, I've thought about a lot i mean there's a lot of like really great like even like long form podcast content on youtube um with video as well as audio um which is sort of an interesting aspect given you know we record video podcasts um but um yeah i mean youtube dl they support just like taking the audio from youtube videos i think you can even get the captions from youtube videos um using youtube dl as well um, so it's a very interesting data source, I would say, um, given it's, um, you know, full band in the sense that it's, you know, good quality audio, good quality video and transcriptions via whatever transcription system Google, Google uses there. Yeah, I've been really interested in this idea of like, um, say, using copyrighted data for machine learning and I recently even read a blog post about it's something like the Authors Guild versus uh, Google, and they sued Google over copyright infringement because they're using the books and yeah, and the recommendation engine. So I, I mean, I I do think this is going to be one of the most interesting topics as we develop these applications because <laughs> this data is how the models are built, and then it's it's kind of hard to get your own data. So it's an interesting thing. I don't know if uh, like YouTube has those kind of licenses when you upload a video. Like I know from uploading my own videos on YouTube, I don't think I'm signing any kind of license that says you can't use it for training whatever video generation model of me you want with it or whatever thing like that. But um, maybe if you're using the captions, maybe you're using their like Google's speech rec speech to text model or something like that. Yeah, that, that whole kind of thing is pretty interesting to me thinking about like the copyrighted uh, data and whether you can use that to train these models. Have you thought about like, as you're developing Zencaster and these tools, have you thought about open sourcing one of these data sets that you're building? I mean, yes. I mean, I, I, I personally love op open source. Um, I would love to be able to open source some of the models we're working on, but also some of them do rely on, um, like user data that we have. Um, of course they, I mean, we like scrub it, scrub with the user data we use. We like anonymize it as much as we can. Um, we don't, um, we don't like copy it onto our local machines. So, but I don't know. It, it's a very weird issue. The issue of, you know, can you release a model that is trained on private data because like you can, if you try and audit like a machine learning model and like figure out if it's using private data, that's like basically impossible. There's zero way to do that unless there's some like build logs built into it or something where you have like file names. But yeah, I've seen, I saw a paper on extracting training data from language models that is, um, I, I think unrealistic the way that they just kind of prompt it and generate the emails and stuff. I, I can't imagine any company would be that careless with how they encode and publish the language models. But so quickly, I do want to get more into, say, federated learning and this idea of how you're how you're um, using data without uh, putting it in a centralized database and this difference further between, say, copyrighted data and then private data, which are two very different things, in my opinion. But one idea I think is really interesting, maybe we could talk about a bit. One other interesting thing about uh, data privacy that I think is really interesting is recent developments in data set distillation. So similar to knowledge distillation, where the idea is to uh, label data by using a teacher model, and then the student model fits the labels of the, that the teacher model has labeled. The way that data, data set distillation works is that you distill the information from the entire training set 
into a into a compressed representation where say you only have 50 images that make up the 50,000 images of CIFAR 10, such that you train on the 50 images and retain the full performance of the original data set. And they optimize that by uh, doing the same kind of gradient ascent technique all the way, putting gradients all the way back into the input, similar to say adversarial noise maps or uh, heat map ap activations where you look at say what uh, part of the image is it looking at to classify it as an elephant or whatever. And so that kind of optimization technique would allow you to maybe retain these data sets. So with federated learning, it seems to me like you send the model weights to the local machine, you update the model, and then you send the new model weights back. But that doesn't sound great for if something went wrong, if you say continual learning, catastrophic forgetting, trying to study all these things. So I think maybe this idea of compressing the data set and then sending this compressed data set back that I think would probably be impossible to invert back to the original data. And then you at least have like some kind of sequence of the data sets that I think is a more useful artifact than just the sequence of model weights that have been updated on the local federated learning kind of way of thinking about this. Okay. Yeah. That's a very interesting idea, like a compressed data set. Like it's almost something I like, it sounds too good to be true. Um, like, so there's like a, you, you mentioned there is like a 50,000 image data set that got compressed to like 50 images. Are they like, are they images within that data set that are just selected from like to be a diverse set of the original data set or? Yeah, I can, well, no, they're, um, they're optimized directly and you use the original data you have and the performance on evaluated on that as the learning signal. And so there are really there there are two techniques that I'd say are worth listeners looking into. The first of which is generative teaching networks, where you have the outer inner optimization loop, where uh, you generate you start off by generating something random like a GAN, and then you use the signal for how well the model trained on that data set performs on it. So it's like a proximal policy optimization, where all you have is the reward signal of the final accuracy. And then there's this other paper from Google, and I'm not going to talk about it too much because I don't really understand these techniques, but it's it's like the neural tangent kernel and the infinite width kind of strategy. And that's that's, <laughs> that's something else that seems to work, but I don't really understand it. Okay, so that's interesting. So it basically selects like 50 images that seem to train the model in the best direction. No, it um it optimizes them directly from random noise. So they, they all start off with 50 random noise images, and then like gradient ascent back to the <laughs> input space. So similar to like, you can stack it all up as a big picture of say, like a giant tensor of 50 by 32 by 32 by three. And then you can send gradients all the way back into that thing. Okay. Wow. I am very curious what those images look like. Yeah. Well, they're, they're mostly random noise in the end. There's still random noise with some, with some kind of patterns, but it's, yeah. I mean, I, I guess it is just like, essentially just like encoding like binary information in those images instead of like actual like human processable images yeah the idea of having zero one in each of the i don't you know that's such a compression i i doubt that there's still probably 32 bit uh or like the you know 255 <laughs> so in addition to the topic of fine tuning and thinking about the data sets that we're using i wanted to ask about like your search pipeline and your retrieval pipeline and what kind of different uh, models you're using. You mentioned earlier that you started off by building a TF-IDF retriever. We've got the sentence transformers retriever. And then Weave8 has the kind of symbolic annotations that you could use. Like I imagine in this case, a symbolic annotation would be uh, just who's speaking. So if, if you and I have an extremely long conversation, maybe it's like a group of 10 of us and we have like a three hour conversation. Maybe when we're searching through it, we would want to annotate it by uh, things that Connor said and put that kind of filter onto it when we're going back into the database or imagine collecting like a, like we record 10 of these conversations in a row, which I think is really exciting for things like say we have a paper reading group. I've seen these, <laughs> these kind of things assembled where we have like 20 people in a paper reading group and you'd imagine putting together 10 sessions and then searching through that. So maybe you'd want the symbolic filter through who's speaking or the date for just all conversations. So what does your kind of search architecture look like for using these different uh, information retrieval components, say? As someone, okay, so as someone sort of unfamiliar with neurosymbolic um, AI, is that, like, could you give me like a, a 10 second crash course on what that means? Oh yeah, so it, it's not even like, 
crazy neurosymbolic AI, just the idea of um, using the filters, using a symbolic filter to facilitate the vector search. So uh, it, it, before you search through all your data, say you're looking through scientific papers where you might have 60 million papers and you only want to see uh, what was published in the symbolic filter in ICML 2021, right? So now you're only searching through, now you're only doing your vector distance search within that subpopulation of your data set that matches the symbolic filter. So I think there's more to the general category of neurosymbolic AI. And I love things like uh, discrete representations and causal inference and you know, but, and high level ideas like system one, system two, thinking fast and slow and all those kinds of ideas. But in this most basic case of a sim neurosymbolic system, we just mean kind of using the symbolic filters to uh, reduce the complexity of the of the space before we do this vector dot product comparison. Okay. So is this a like distinct from, so how is this distinct from just like a near, a near text query, for example? Um, maybe it... Right. With the near text, say you've got the 60 million papers, the ICML filter would probably reduce it down to, I think 5,000 papers are published in that. I hope that number is right, but like it would take it from 60 million to 5,000. And then you would do then you could just you wouldn't even need an approximate nearest neighbor algorithm anymore, like face or um, HNSW. At that point, you pretty, you could just brute force it. Okay, so you basically give some like keywords, like whatever the name of that conference is, and it's able to pick out. Um, yeah, and what's super cool about that is you can either use keywords, and it, you can use keywords in say um, in text, or you can match it within the data space itself. But in images or audio, that might not that analog might not translate so well. But what WeVA does, which is really interesting, is you annotate the metadata. So you can use, you don't have to necessarily get the keyword from the data itself. It could be a meta tag on it, like the domain it was sort, or what or what time you got, you got that data, or <laughs> any kind of tag you might want to put on it, like a SQL database is your hand, handling maybe like high velocity data that you have constantly updating things. Okay. so. so Symbolic is base is symbolic just like introducing sort of like more classical like database functionality into vector search. Yeah, well, I guess I guess you could get pretty like into all that kind of symbolic filter, all that kind of logic and maybe like relational algebra to speed up the retrieval. But yeah, for now, I think all we're doing is just <laughs> in the set. I mean, yeah, but I mean, I use um, like symbolic filters like all the time. Um, in our data set, um, we, we use, we have, um, unfortunately, since we doesn't have a cursor API yet, um, they have, yeah, we, we have transcripts by, um, like a, a date time stamp and we can search through like, um, each one by day that way. Um, and we sort of like mimic a cursor API by like returning all the transcripts from each day over time. So a cursor API is um, something that traverses a database based on the uh, like the time encoding? Um, not necessarily the time encoding. It's just by something. Like in, in MongoDB, it's like if you do like a find query, um, it traverses by like the natural insert order, um, which is basically, I think it's just the, the actual ID, but like sorted. Like the Mongo object ID, like the the hex object, it just goes through those, um, I believe, lexicographically. Um, but yeah, I, that's like one thing that VV8 doesn't have yet that we're sort of working around. But how about the um, just the Git GraphQL? How is? Can you tell me a little more about that? Because I'm not too familiar with the say the limitations of VV8's GraphQL API. Yeah, I mean the GraphQL is is pretty pretty great. Um, I always heard th good things about it, but hadn't used it until I started trying out Weavey 8. Um, but yeah, the Weavey 8 console, um, it's, yeah, it's uh, basically, it's some website that Weavey 8 hosts that you can like connect it to your local mission, local Weavey 8 instance and build queries and it remembers your history. So it's super, super nice to like be able to just like log, log into that and have all the queries you've run uh, recently. Um, but the GraphQL is great. Um, it has uh, nice ag aggregate functions. It looks like in the latest version of Weaviate, we actually they actually added 
um, the ability to aggregate over references, which is pretty big um, for me at least. So like, for example, if we have um, some text that has like a list of like entities that appear within the text and those entities are their own different class and they're linked to the original text with um, a cross reference, you can just aggregate over um, those um, entities and get a total count of entities that way, which is pretty, pretty cool. Um, but yeah, it's the GraphQL interface is, is pretty amazing. I actually watched um, Bob's uh, did a talk at like a GraphQL conference, which is really interesting. Um, something I'm kind of interested in myself. But yeah, it's great. It's great. Yeah, I've been uh, studying a lot of Bob's talks on uh, GraphQL, and uh, Laura Ham has a lot of great talks as well on data science with GraphQL and showing uh, how they use this GraphQL API. And to me, I guess it's really extensible, the idea that you start collecting data and you flexibly want to update the schema and then also flexibly want to update what's being returned from the thing, as well as uh, what you're talking about with the cross-referencing ability. And so just quickly before, I also want to talk about the semi console a little more because I think that's an awesome feature of it and the GUI of getting to have the client to play around with your database. I know all like the SQL things have clients where you can query your data set and get used to that, but it's it's a lot of fun to see it with a vector with a deep learning search engine. I think it's super cool to see that client GUI. So I definitely want to talk about that. But um, before getting too off topic, I wanted to talk a little more about the cross-referencing and say, so I was sold on the idea of uh, when I first started learning about GraphQL, that the reason GraphQL is better than REST APIs is because you only need to make one query to the uh, to the to just the API, say, to get to to traverse through all the different kinds of tables you might have. In the sense of in GraphQL and JSON, we think of it as class property compared to whereas in relational databases we think of it as tables, and we'd be using keys to join the keys and traverse it. So is that is that really a big selling point for you that you don't have to make five API requests, you just make one API request and that kind of difference between GraphQL and REST APIs? Yeah, it's 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 quite amazing for me um, personally. Um, I, I mean, I enjoy it. It's basically like a NoSQL database, but with like extra functionality to do the, like those cross references within like a single query. Um, which is really powerful because like I, I'd been using like MongoDB and I'd have to like look for one document, you know, find the the related field key for like another document and like do like three separate queries to get where I need to go, um, which is like a hassle. But yeah, no, no, this is great. You just, you pick out um, a cross-reference, you place it onto whatever class you want to read it with, um, I mean, it has to be like a single class, a certain class, but um, yeah, that's incredibly powerful for me and expressive. Um, and just sort of feels like the future, you know? It's, you don't waste any time. Yeah, yeah. It seems um, very intuitive, also easier to communicate and share uh, what it's doing and how to use it, so to say, compared to say SQL, where you need to like pass an interview to, to, to know how to query it. Whereas I think the GraphQL thing has a, has a quicker learning curve. I, don't, I still can't really form GraphQL or SQL queries um, without looking up like half the things I write. It's, it's rough, especially joins. In GraphQL, it's real dead simple. You know, you just say what you want, you get a JSON object, it's magic. Yeah, I remember taking those classes where you do like the uh, running time complexity of like inner join, outer join, all that kind of stuff. And on this topic of kind of like the software engineering tooling, and um, I wanted to ask about like um, your experience with say Docker containers and the Helm chart, and if you could just kind of explain all of that to people and what it takes to take your Weaviate instance and then deploy it and make it accessible through something like AWS or Google Cloud. Sure. Yeah. So, I mean, Weavey, it has like really great um, uh, deployment uh, manifests, I guess, um, in both the Docker Compose that they have, which is definitely the way to do it if you just want to stand it up quickly. Um, and then also the Helm charts. And the Helm charts um, are basically just like Kubernetes 
um, instructions for um, a, like a Kubernetes, Kubernetes cluster to actually deploy. I think um, I think it's like on AWS, it's like EKS. That's like their Kubernetes service. Elastic Kubernetes service, I want to say. I don't know. It's probably wrong. But yeah, so uh, you could just apply the Helm chart. Um, and as long as you have enough, um, you know, uh, pods provisions, it'll just pick up um, all those pods and get them deployed and let them talk to each other. Um, I know for us, we also had to add just like a really basic ingress. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's something like we, we, we should do on our side anyway, because it's sort of specific to our network. But um, yeah, I mean, it really is as simple as just like setting up a Kubernetes cluster and do like cube control apply and the helm chart, and that's it. So it's just like one click from when you click on uh, like get your Docker compose file and then just one click on AWS, so like how many how many steps is there in the middle of that? For well, for the Docker Compose, that's just you know you go to the website and you say what your configuration should be. It gives you a, a curl command to just download the Compose and then Docker Compose up, and there you go. It's deployed. It's crazy, and the the Helm chart. Um, yeah, I mean, so we did. So the Helm chart right now is not like built into that like really nice installation interface on the Wii V8 documentation. So uh, what we did was we basically just forked um, the Helm chart, picked what version we wanted, and then um, made some configurations for what we want. So we like disabled some of the modules we didn't use. Uh, we pers we also personally disable um, auto schema um, just to keep the data a bit more rigid because um, it's being written to you by a few different services. So having error messages is pretty useful there. Um, yeah. I mean, once you have the Helm chart and it's configured, uh, you just apply it and bam, it's just like that. You can get some monitoring from, I think AWS, their Kubernetes cluster has monitoring built in, which is nice. Um, and you could zoom into like any of the logs on each pod. So, yeah. Super cool. And so one other kind of uh, meta question about these things is, um, how has your experience been using the WeV8 Slack? To me, it, it seems like Slack is going to play, I guess, like Slack and also obviously like raising issues within GitHub when you have issues with these newer kind of open source tools. Do you think the Slack chat has been you know, pr like pretty well organized to me, it seems like a pretty vibrant community as I've been kind of exploring different open source software as Slack chats and seeing how well they're uh, answering questions that people face. And do you think like uh, recently we interviewed Michael Wetchner building Katie and we've integrated Katie into we 8 and, uh, and so it's going to be able to do question answering within these Slack chats, which I think is particularly the idea of duplicate question detection, I think could be really useful for Slack chats. So do you have any thinking about just how the Slack chat question answering kind of system could be improved? Yeah, I mean, yeah, that duplicate question thing is really interesting because, I mean, the thing about a Slack is that a lot of people don't really consider like searching through the old conversations to find previous answers. So a lot of the stuff gets answered twice. If Katie helps with that, that'd be really wonderful. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think in general, the Slack channel is um, a really useful resource. Um, for me, like I've sort of learned to like search through old messages first. Um, but like a lot of like the basic stuff, the basic problems I run into, I could solve with a simple search there. Um, yeah, I mean, just talking about some stuff on the Slack channel, like has like created some bug tickets that got fixed in the latest release. Um which is really amazing. I mean, it's just a great turnaround, just like being able to like talk to like, is it Et Etienne? Is that? Okay. I hope I'm pronouncing that correct. Yeah, um, being able to talk to Etienne um, and Bob too, of course. Um, it's really, really wonderful. They're always like pretty on, they're on top of all the questions I ask. Um, I do wish sometimes that I 
would have uh, made an issue on GitHub instead of uh, asking on Slack. Because then I would get the GitHub clout of having more issues on my little like four axis diagram on my GitHub profile. But I guess I can live with just getting what I want. Yeah, I want to get like a little little semi technologies badge on my page. That'd be nice. Yeah, that's a really interesting thing. That topic around I mean we're we're gonna get a little off going the talking about this, but that topic around say these question answering systems and it kind of comes back to talking about copyrighted data and data privacy, how you contributing your question answer kind of builds the technology. And I think I don't know if what I think about these like ideas of dividing up companies, open source products into tokens and then distributing the tokens based on your contribution to things like that. But that kind of idea of um, rewarding people who contribute to the platform because the platform or contribute to the product really through their data and their conversations and their uh, like user testimonials, so to say. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. Um, I mean, it's something we've also like been considering on, at Zencaster too, um, it's just sort of how to incentivize people to sort of help with the machine learning tasks. Um, you know, we have, I mean, we've hired like some contractors to like help like annotate some data a few times. Um, but yeah, it's, 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 it's a weird thing motivating people to do things without like, without money, I guess. Um, cause I mean, like people get training data in a lot of different ways, like say like Netflix, they have like their like star system or they did, I don't know. I think it's like thumbs up, thumbs down now. Yeah. I don't know. It's just a very like arbitrary thing that like people don't put much thought into, but that sort of trains like an entire like monster of a recommendation system. Um, and I don't know, I, that might, I think, honestly, that's like something they consider when they actually design how, what this looks like. They want people to sort of not think about it too much, um, which I guess is like a natural thing to do. You want like a, the lowest barrier of entry um, to actually getting the data, but. It's interesting, like, um, there's like how you're liking and even just like your watch time on the videos or reading time on articles, how that trains some super recommendation algorithm. And then there's things like, uh, I've been looking into training a language model on the Keras code examples contribution where, uh, contributing to that gives you like a reputational boost because you've written this tutorial similar to like a GitHub contribution. So you get more, you have more of a built in kind of feedback than just clicking like and training a recommendation algorithm that way. But yeah, I think this kind of topic around uh, data uh, ownership and and then the resulting machine learning products is definitely uh, one of the most interesting kind of topics. So kind of wrapping up around uh, search and thinking about uh, searching through podcasts, do you think, say, the clip model for image text, do you think that there'll be any use for, say, image search within podcasts? Or do you think that's probably, or maybe even audio where I don't know, maybe, because I imagine even audio, you always have the text transcription. Do you see any kind of multimodal, whether it's images or audio or using the stack of image audio uh, text and video to maybe search through that kind of way? Or do you think all the useful applications are probably just searching through text? Yeah, so that's um, that's something we've, we've you know, we have a lot of uh, multimedia data. Um, or like podcasting in itself is sort of like a multimedia format. Um, and yeah, we are just using text right now, but the clip model is really interesting um, to consider the ability to sort of search through video with text, like sort of describe what's in the image. Um, I think the only reason we haven't like sort of made more of an effort to like explore that is that, you know, podcasts tend to be, you know, a talking head. In a, in a random background. So I don't imagine there'd be much sort of video information in there um, besides like general like descriptions of the person talking, I believe. But yeah, I don't know. Maybe if you've ever thought about like um, treating, say, like a commentary on a sports game as a podcast where you kind of have that 
uh, dual entertainment factor of you have the two people talking to annotate and then you have the basketball game or whatever it is. And then maybe you want to, so maybe in that kind of case, you want to search through like a dunk and you give it like an image or a dot, maybe that kind of setting. I'm not sure. I don't know. That's just a really funny idea to me, like searching for a dunk on a, on a podcast. Um, but yeah, actually, yeah, that, that's a really interesting concept. I mean, um, that almost sounds like a goldmine of training data for a clip model like that. But, but yeah, I mean, for, for us, we don't, um, have, um, the ability to like link, um, podcasts with like other media at the moment. Uh, but yeah, if we did, that'd be a really, really interesting way to, to actually search through that. I mean, we have tons of like sports podcasts, of course, but, um, and if we did have access to those like sports, you know, videos, we could in theory, try and like figure out which podcast goes to which sports event, assuming it's like live casted or like maybe like a after game kind of debrief. Yeah. Maybe even not just sports, but just like uh video games, like uh call of duty and all that kind of, obviously there's such a vibrant gaming community around that. And, and you could imagine you have an image of say a reward a player receives in the game and you can, and you can use that to find out exactly when it happened. Although you could, pr- you probably don't need deep learning search. You could probably just do an exact match. If you had something like that, like say you, when you've like, won the game you're on like a plus 5,000 flashes on the screen and now you want to index where that happened in the game maybe some idea like that I don't know, think about commenting and having kind of podcasts and then also live content and I'm trying to imagine some way in which an image search would aid in that yeah if, it, if this was like twitch where like you had like large like streams of like video game content with like audio that'd be very interesting to try out also, it's it's a bit trippy to think about um, doing like clip like video and audio embedding search on a virtual world created by like a few developers at like a development studio. I don't know. It's it seems very. It seems like you would have to train a clip model on like the video game to get good results because it is not the real world. Yeah. That's why we always have to talk about off the shelf models and fine tuning that topic I think is because I think there's a lot of breakthroughs in off the shelf models, like especially the way that prompting seems to guide language models to, to have that generalization and access information that you didn't know it contained because you didn't know how to ask it if it contained it. So maybe I think prompting is a really interesting argument for off-the-shelf models, but that idea of fine-tuning in domain, I think it's interesting. I mean, this idea, I think most people who've studied machine learning are thinking, oh, it definitely needs to be fine-tuned in domain because that idea of being able to be flexible to any kind of data distribution is just like, violates your training sort of, and you don't think that that kind of thing is possible. But I do think um, it's trending towards that way, which is definitely exciting. Yeah, I mean... I mean, I always think about how, you know, as humans, we can understand what's happening in like just about anything. Like we have context about like, say if we say that we are trying to process um, like some media as just as like the clip to VEC model is, you know, we can like look at like a podcast video and like describe what's happening like very easily. Um, We can also look at like a video game and describe what's happening very easily. Um, so, I mean, it, I take that as proof as there is um, the possibility of like generating a model like that generalizes like as well as humans. Um, you know, I think like the architecture is sort of the, the limiting factor. We just got to like figure out how to actually set up like a neural network to mimic the, the neural pathways we have um, and on the scale we have. I don't really, I don't know like the number, I'm sure there's some research into like how many like, um, how many equivalent 
like um, parameters we have in our brain versus like some like large neural network. Yeah, I think it's, I mean, I'm, I don't want to say a number and then be wrong, but I remember Lex Fridman made a video on this where it's about comparing, comparing uh, GPT-3 with our brain. And I think we have something like on the scale of a trillion parameters, they say, I don't know if that's right, but more than GPT-3, I think. Yeah, but to anyone interested, Lex Fridman has made a good video that uh, goes into that kind of idea of the size comparison between GPT-3 and, and human brains. But I think there's, like you said, the architecture design, there's still like a, a missing piece for probably several missing pieces, but there's definitely still more to whether it's a neural architecture search, or I think ideas like trying to go past a global backpropagation and things like cellular automata and a local heavy and learning, these kinds of ideas, I think will be interesting too. But yeah, that kind of neural architecture search is definitely seems like something that will have a huge impact. And and it's interesting because things like, say, the the vision transformers have had such a massive impact. And then all these designs now is they're trying to figure out how to go beyond 512 tokens and the sparse transformer, long former, <laughs> wind former, all these kinds of ideas that seem really exciting. But I find it amazing that um, that uh, automated neural architecture search like NosNet or the Evolve transformer still hasn't, uh, say, taken off and isn't really leading the new architectures. Have you thought about neural architecture search and that kind of area of research and any thoughts on whether that will take us to like the next level, so to say? So by neural architecture search, are you talking about like the models that like try to more closely mimic like the human brain? More so like where you, um, you identify some building blocks, some kind of like computational primitives that you might have, whether it's a depth wise, separable convolution, multi-head self-attention, multi-layer perceptron, average pooling along some axis, like, or like a batch normalization or different activation layers. And you try to encode that in like a zero one G, uh, like genotype. And then you say use evolution where you mutate those genotypes and try to render some architecture that achieves. Oh, uh, okay. Okay. So it's like evolutionary architecture. That's really interesting. Um, yeah, I mean, I think sort of like a combination of, I think that is sort of the next step because I mean, if you think about the human brain, we have like a bunch of different like lobes that like perform different functions that they seem to be specialized in. So, um, and they all work in tandem, I, ass I assume. I'm not a neuroscientist, but, um, you know, if if we can somehow train a, a grand neural network that can actually decide, oh, this architecture isn't really performing as well as we'd like to. Um, and, you know, replace it with another one or like decrease its size or something like that. Um, I mean, it sounds like a pain to efficiently train with all those different sort of architectures floating around, but I think that should, that, that should work. I mean, I can't imagine why it wouldn't. And I imagine it would perform better than a lot of the existing models if large enough. Yeah, and I think the current trend to scaling is uh, the mixture of experts thing, where it's not exactly like different parts of your lobes have different, say, uh, structural forms, but they have different specializations, so to say. And then you have the kind of meta learned. Uh, it's like the way the mixture of experts work is you have an attention layer that basically says which which pathways to send the computation to. So it's you know, very wide rather than very deep, say, and you have the attention that routes along the width so that you don't have the dense because these models are gigantic. Like the latest, um, and they call it glam or some title like that from Google is like a trillion parameters because they can scale that kind of thing up like crazy. And then you have lessons like how sparsity works. You have infinite width networks. It seems like scaling width wise is, <laughs> is promising as well. So Definitely a lot of interesting ideas, and I really enjoyed uh, talking about all these ideas with you, and I'm really excited to see the evolution of Zencaster. It did a good job recording our podcast now, and we'll search through the transcript. And I do I think that there are so many exciting applications of search through podcasts. We mentioned a couple of things like, um, say, having a paper reading group where you have 20 people in a discussion and you meet for, say, 12 weeks a row, in a row, and now you have kind of a something that is worthwhile to search through. And Things like, say, commentary on events, I think, could be something that you also end up with this, these really interesting data sets. 
So I'm really excited to see how uh, Zencaster integrates search and how search will hit the kind of podcasting uh, medium and what kind of ideas can emerge. And I think even just like chunking up the podcast into chapters could be a really interesting way to annotate it too. And just, it just like extracting the salient point. Yeah, yeah, it was wonderful talking today. Um, thank you for having me. Um, and yeah, I'm excited to see uh, how we VA grows and how we can integrate it more with Zencaster. I think it's, um, I think it's gonna be great.